Okay. I think if people come along, we will let them in. Oh, they're still coming. <laughs> they're still coming. Hello, welcome. Great. Okay. Okay. I'm going to begin um, rather than hold off any longer. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's conversation, which is part of Fevered Sleep Project, this brief thing. I'm Sam Butler, and I'm the co-artistic director of Fevered Sleep, along with David Haraday. Fevered Sleep is a cross-disciplinary arts organisation, and we make performance and film and uh, installations and digital art. I have to remember myself, there's so many different things. Um, and our project, this grief thing, invites people to talk and think and learn about grief. It takes place in many forms. Um, we have clothing and performances, billboards, posters, shops, and at the moment, market stalls as well. Um, and for the current version of this project, these online conversations that bring together all sorts of people who have something to say about grief. So I'm really delighted that this evening's conversation is between Linda Machin and Simon Bray. There they are. Um, hello. Hi. hi. Dr. Linda Machin specializes in bereavement research and practice, developing a theoretical model of grief and a practice tool, the Adult Attitude to Grief Scale. And Linda is an honorary research fellow of Kiel and Lancaster Universities, a freelance trainer and honorary clinical advisor for Cruise Bereavement Care. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. And Simon Bray is a Manchester-based artist, maker of the photographic project Loved and Lost, in inviting participants to explore their experiences of loss. His work has been shown at the Southbank Centre, Manchester International Festival, the Whitworth, Sheffield, Sheffield Museum um, and Home, and has also featured by Guardian Weekend, The One Show, British Journal of Photography and National Geographic. Wow, welcome Simon. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'll briefly explain the structure of the conversation before they begin. So in a minute, I'm gonna disappear and Linda and Simon uh, will have around 45 minutes to chat together and to share their personal and professional experience of or perspectives on grief. So we've asked them not to prepare anything in advance um, and I've just checked and they haven't done that. It's good to know. <laughs> um, so the reason for that is that the conversation is uh, free flowing and, um, and informal. Um, so after the conversation, I'll come back on screen and we'll have around half an hour for Linda and Simon to respond to any thoughts or questions you may have. Um, and if at that point you have a thought or a question to share, just use the raise hand emoji on your screen. But if you'd like me to ask the question on your behalf, you can write it in the chat box, which will be enabled then. So thanks again, Simon and Linda. I'm gonna leave you two to talk and I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. Well, here we are. So, Simon, I, I'm intrigued about your work with photographs because I'm conscious when I'm working with someone who's bereaved, often, particularly if that's been a home visit, a photograph will be a starting point. So uh, uh, tell us a, a little bit about your project. So Love and Lost is based around a, an old family photograph. So um, I started it uh, firstly with uh, my mum, and, there was a, and I, I asked her about if she was going to restage an old photograph, which one would she choose of, of her and dad? And there was one that, that was taken a few days after they were engaged at the top of a hill in town in Hampshire where, they, um, where they'd met and they were, were living. And uh, so we went back and re restaged that picture. And um, we went back to the house then and, and sort of conducted a sort of an interview. And I asked her about her experience of um, losing dad and the sort of relationship they had, which was very different to obviously the relationship that I had with dad. Uh, and I found out lots of stuff actually in that process that I didn't know about dad and saw it from my mum's perspective. And, and that was just the sort of format which, which then grew into what is now the Loved and Lost Project. So there's about 25 different stories and they all start with um, an old family photograph. Uh, and I invite the 
participants to go back to the location of the picture to restage it. And um, then we then, you know, the initial uh, reception of the of the project is is the, those two images side by side, the old and the new. And that's not a new technique, you know, uh, using photography to show the passing of time isn't something um, unique to, to my work at all, but it's a very good vehicle in, in the sense of, of loss and grief to uh, engage the viewer in, in the story, because obviously in the second image, somebody's missing, or maybe multiple people are missing. Uh, and it invites the question of who's missing and why they're missing and, and where have they gone, and invites the viewer to sort of delve a little bit deeper, I suppose, which is which is then where I follow up with subsequent um, photography and also um, the interview aspect as well, to sort of take the chance to ask people about their experience of grief. So photography, um, you know, I'm a professional photographer. I work in lots of guises, commercially, editorially, and also on projects. So, um, you know, photography is, is everything for me, I suppose. And it's, um, but in terms of my grief, it's certainly been, something that's been extremely important, important in me engaging um, others in conversations about their grief in order to inform my own understanding of my own grief, um, as well as the images that, and you can probably see on my shoulder, the images that I have up in the house of, of, um, of family members who are, are no longer um, with me. And, and it's extremely important for me to have those images around. So is it possible to share any any particular one that sort of chart out? You've mentioned that of your mother and father and, and how that was explored. Mm. Uh, have you got another example that would help us see what that process is for people in being able to um, unpack their story of grief? You mean it's something personal to me or something from oh, the project? Well, I mean, whichever, you, you know, I, I'm just interested in it. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a process that is very particular uh, to the um, medium you use, but indeed echoes a lot of the sort of things I would be doing. So, I, you know, I'm just interested to hear a bit more about that as a process. Mm. Well, I suppose when I ask people about finding a photograph, they... There's the sort of, there'll be two responses. They'll inst they either instantly know which one uh, it'll have been on the mantelpiece or on the fridge, or it'll just be the one that they have in their daily lives that they see. Or they'll think, oh, I have to search through the family albums or the folders on the computer to, to find what I think is the right image in the right place. Um, and and it can really vary, but I, I suppose for quite a lot of the stories, people are finding um, older images and so you can tell as as a photographer but uh, you know as, as any, anybody could really is, is tell that the passing of time from the imagery because of the nature of the photograph um, because it was taken on 35 millimeter film and and has that certain aesthetic about it and maybe it's aged or the, the colors are faded or something like that so um, there's a real importance in the in the artifact itself as it, it, it within the project there's a um, a story um, I told with a woman called Nicola and she's standing at the top of a hill in Lancashire with her brother and her mother and father um, all sort of grounded around the sort of trig point at the top um, and you can see that that image was taken you know about 40 years ago but when we returned it was a really important process for Nicola because it was the first time she'd been back um, you know in 40 years and she'd lost all three members of, of her family over, over that period of time um, and in quite a few different ways and and, uh, and it was important for her to go back to the place um, because it was a case of um, it's a very sensory experience the sights and the sounds and the smells and engaging all of those things to evoke the memories of, of the time before and um, and so so I will take people through that process of, of returning and, and restaging the picture um, as a means to invite them back into the stories and the memories, I suppose, which then informs the conversation that we have afterwards, which we record, um, you know, over a, sometimes over a cup of tea, sometimes over a pint in the pub, you know, wherever feels suitable. But that, um, that I suppose, is uh, in the sort of, in a professional sense, is the, is the part that links more with your um, work, I suppose, because uh, what I feel like I'm trying to do is offer somebody a platform to engage with their 
experience of grief and and verbalize it in a way and that can be very hard and you know there's often times we'll both sit there being quite emotional but um it feels like often the scenario is that people haven't ever been asked these questions before uh but they're but they're they've put themselves forward to be, be part of the project and and they're willing to tell me a stranger um you know uh they're the sort of you know deepest emotional um stories i suppose so and i'm not trained in any way i you know i have to sort of preface this within the project to say look i'm not a trained counselor and this isn't this isn't something that i'm going to guide you through to try and find a an, uh, any sense of resolution but it, it's but i say you know this is my story and these are the people i've lost and this is what it felt like and and you build a sense of that affinity and that um collaboration i suppose in terms of having that conversation which i which you know and i won't say too much because this is something that you know far more about than i do in terms of your work um i'd imagine but, but it, it 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 feels to me and you know this is one of the things that although i've spent a lot of time uh, developing work that can be used therapeutically in a very specific therapeutic sense i'm also very anxious that we don't professionalize grief and that we allow uh, the fact that we're all human and we're all encountering that sort of um, experience uh, for ourselves and with each other that we can have that human response and it feels as if you're using a very um, um, interesting but in a sense ordinary vehicle for those sorts of conversations and um you know i i think that's 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 really interesting that that it unlocks the door in a sense on the story um and i suppose it it sort of is matched with a much more therapeutic tool that i've developed that helps people tell the story which is the adult attitude to grief scale and that really came about because um, I began my uh, working life as, as a medical social worker and would work in a hospital setting with people who were dying and their families. I had no grief to uh, carry on working with them once the patient had died. And I was very aware in observing those families that there was a lot of vulnerability being carried on into bereavement. And I just wondered where that was going. I had a chance later on to develop that and to do some research and just listening to stories of grief. I was conscious, and this is something that people will say, everybody's different. Mm, and, and although that is true, what I began to see was a pattern. And I developed that pattern into the range of response to loss, which provides the spectrum of the kind of uh, reactions and responses people will make. So, for example, uh, that model it is two-dimensional. One dimension is about the reactions we have when we lose or are bereft. And um, that spectrum is um, a span from being overwhelmed in our reactions to being controlled in our reactions. So that we have acquired, all of us, through um, our own personality, observing other people, what we've been taught, to have a notion about how we regulate or don't or express our emotions. So some people will be more inclined to express them and some people will be more inclined to hold on to them. So we begin to see a range across that spectrum in terms of how people deal with feelings and how they deal with the thoughts associated with those feelings. But then the second dimension is a much more conscious one. That happens almost instinctively, sort of as an immediate reaction uh, when, when we experience a loss. Alongside that is a second dimension, which is a much more conscious one, which is about how do we cope? How do we cope with the spectrum of our own reactions? And how do we cope? with the consequences of the loss we've suffered and how do we begin to weave that into some sort of meaning 
So it's a model that actually captures diversity. And uh, one of the things that I was um, trying to do early on was to validate this as a notion of grief and did it by devising the adult attitude to grief scale. I and mean, it was a research uh, instrument at that time. Uh, but what we found having done the research with bereaved people, it gave a wonderful profile of people's grief. And it's just a nine statement scale. There are three um, statements which are about being overwhelmed by your grief. There are three which reflect being in control of your grief. And there are three which are about resilience, which in essence is about that capacity to balance those things. And is the capacity to actually move not away from what you've lost, but with it in a way that can be um, uh, positive rather than negative. And a lot of what I've done is to focus on resilience rather than the, the kind of pathology of grief and the problems of grief and, the, uh, and, and the, the kind of downside of grief, but to see that those things can happen um, um, naturally. And I think what I have found, that's a, a long <laughs> preamble in response, but the, the AAG scale, the Adult Attitude to Grief scale, uh, is used by a lot of services now to assess people and to see how their grief is changing over time and over the time of support. But the important thing is that it's not like a psychometric test where someone will respond to it and wonder, what is this about? People will say, ah, other people think, feel this too. Uh, this is a real affirmation that what's going on for me, although it's pretty awful, uh, is happening for other people as well. So that we have a lot of feedback of people understanding and, and having an insight. And so it's used with practitioners as, as a conversation piece, I guess a little bit like your photographs, as a conversation piece uh, to enable each to understand the grief more. Mm -hmm. I think as people have the opportunity to articulate their grief, th their acceptance of it often increases. Um, so I don't know if, if, if that begins to resonate with, with, with some of, of, of your work, Simon. Yeah, it does in, in so many ways, actually. And I think the reason for me starting my project was that, you know, as somebody in their early 20s, that I didn't have many peers or places to turn to know that I wasn't the only one who had ever lost their dad, um, you know, to a serious illness. Uh, and it wasn't a shock uh, in terms of, you know, we knew he was very ill, but but actually, you know, it still hits you very hard. And I was in the middle of finishing the final year of my degree and there were, there were so many factors to it. But um, I, I think the, the other thing is there's, there's this sort of maybe unspoken notion that you go through a period of grief and then it comes to an end at some point. And I, I really like the, the consideration of, of what you're discussing there that actually, um, you know, we're, we're changed because of our grief. I know I, I'm changed because of my grief. That that you that those those things that you experience and take on board, do you you build them into your life in a way that you know you you, you reframe things. You re, it reshapes you. And and I, and the word resilience is really interesting because um, resilience would often the notion of resilience would often muster a sense of. Um, I mean, if you said resilience in another context it would feel like it was very um, hard. It would be like, you have to stop and just be resilient. And, you know, there's no, you know, don't, don't let the, the, the things get to you, you know, but actually what you're talking about, I think, and, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is about um, feeling in the, the understanding of your emotional context and the things you want to take forward and, and sort of helping yourself reframe your, your, your own self and your experience within a broader context of, of your life and what else you go on to do is absolutely and, and resilience i would see is never about getting over mm. <laughs> your loss 
yeah. or ignoring it in some way because that becomes a, um, a function of like the control. I mean, often it, we can be controlling and not engaging with it. Um, resilience is often about really engaging with the pain, but accepting that as normal within ourselves. And I think, as you rightly say, that in this definition of resilience, and I, th I, I think maybe if it's used differently, it's being misused. Mm. Resilience is really about embracing realities and seeing the way in which resourcefulness of the person can embrace that change, uh, not turn their back on it um, and, and, and move beyond it. Uh, they can move further away from the anguish, but actually still have that sense of, of connectedness and, and their own story being linked um, to, to, to the person. And I think one of the things even within um, um, professional care of the bereaved, um, there has been this long standing or early theoretical perspective that talked about stages and phases of grief. Yeah, I was going to come into that and ask you, yeah. <laughs> which, which it has given us a lot of information about some of the characteristics of grief, but as a process is seen now as very unhelpful and an inaccurate reflection. And that in fact, it can do a lot of harm. Unfortunately, it has sort of been um, adopted into the into our culture and and you will see journalists writing about uh, the stages of grief in relation not to just bereavement but to, to all sorts of major life losses and and that and people will say of themselves oh I'm in the angry stage or I'm in you know and and that feels um, a very curtailing perspective it it doesn't allow and, and what I'm always wanting to to get as a kind of balance between understanding the patterns I've described in the range of response to loss model and the very individual way it begins to emerge with um, when we use the AAG scale that, that we, we are seeing that people have got sometimes there's a real tension between aspiring for control and normally being a person who's in control and suddenly finding it's not working, something's spilling across and that tension that can occur. So there's a whole variety within that model that we can observe that's highly individual, the process is individual. And we, we have to recognize the context in which people grieve is very, very different. They, they may have circumstances that make it very hard to pay attention to their own pain for some people, they may be relieved that that's the case, but for other people, uh, this is put on hold and uh, the folk around them may be very confused if the grief suddenly arises and has been triggered by something uh, quite different. I remember once um, working with an elderly gentleman who was a widower mm -hmm. and he said to me, we worked for a little while, and he said, um, his pet dog died. And he said, I'm really worried, he said, because I feel distraught about the dog dying. And I've shown far more emotion uh, than I did when my wife died. And I'm thinking people will imagine, I think more of, I thought more of my dog than my wife. But those are the kind of triggers that will take people back. And I guess your photographs are the triggers as well, that taking people back. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, it's not about emphasising, um, you know, a memory of a much better time. It's not necessarily about that, but it, but it is about acknowledging that um, that was, you know, I mean, if a photograph can be, you know, a hundredth of a second. It's, it's such a minute fraction of time, but actually we, yeah, we sort of memorialize them and we and we place um, a huge amount of emotional context on onto images especially but I mean, in terms of what you're saying it rings true so much for me having having lost dad and then sort of um, not had much context for that and, and sort of taken some time to to go and think about what I was going to do professionally after my degree and then 
begin the projects and start having these conversations. But actually the thing that the trigger for me was when my mum moved out of the house that we'd, um, I spent my whole childhood in, and that would have been, you know, the only place in which my dad and I had lived together. And he would, he'd spend every hour of daylight in the garden caring for that. And, and you know, there were so many happy memories. And, and you know, that was the, the sort of grounding of my, of my life until I, I moved for university. Um, and I went, I went on the last day to help her pack things away. And that morning I was very quiet and I just had to sort of pack some boxes, but the afternoon I was, uh, I was an absolute wreck. I, it just, it just absolutely, as you said, tip, it tipped me over the edge and I, and it really took me by surprise. It, it, oh, goodness knows how many years it was, uh, maybe five or six years after he passed away. But I felt so much more emotional, you know, in, in a very concise way, you know, for a few hours um, that day than I did you know, when dad, you know, died, because it, it, that was just spread over days, weeks, months, years, I suppose, of, of trying to um, get to grips with it and understand it and come to terms with it. But, but, you know, that one afternoon, it was just this sort of mass outpouring. And um, I think it took my mum a bit by surprise, because actually, she'd made this decision. And I think she felt a bit bad that she'd made a decision to move away from this house. And, uh, you know, which is the right thing to do. Um, but actually, you know, it was it was a real trigger point. I mean, the flip side for that, for me is, um, in a, <clears throat> again, in a personal sense, was uh, losing my sister three years ago. She was only twenty nine and um, and had a had a short but quite severe illness. And um, a month after she passed away, I lost my nan. And then two months after that, my my daughter was born. And I've since had uh, a son six months ago. So my my capacity and emotional headspace for thinking about my sister and engaging with that in a very sort of tangible way feels um, sort of curtailed by the fact that I'm putting so much attention on um, my new family. Uh, and that's a lovely thing. It's a really important place for me to direct my, you know, love and my, my attention. But I, at the back of my mind, I do worry, you know, what's going to be the thing that triggers my, uh, you know, emotional outpouring of, of losing my sister because I don't really uh, know to what extent I've been able to process that yet. I guess the fact that you're conscious that that is work that may still to be done mm. will be triggered, but not necessarily in a way that will startle you quite in the way that it can startle some people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I think and, and it struck me when you were describing your mother's reaction when you were obviously upset. I, I think we have one of those sayings in our culture, if someone uh, is upset, that people will say, oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I didn't want to upset you. Mm. And I want to say, actually, that person is upset already. A kindness or a trigger will allow what is welling up inside to happen anyway. So I, I think there's a lot of misconception within our culture about uh, that, that we are having to work against when when we are grieving and I think some of the natural sequences um, I mean you're describing how your new family is is perhaps uh, in your own mind uh, standing in the way of some of the the, the processing you might want to do mm -hmm. but it, it's the warp and weft of life uh, and, and Again, uh, a lot of our grief doesn't necessarily sit nice and tidily in sequence with, with a, a loss that we've had. Mm. I wanted to ask you a bit about um, timescales as well. And, and as, you know, I know you, you acknowledge the, the notion of um, sort of trying to move away from defining um, certain periods. And, and I think it's absolutely right to try and en engage sort of complexities of individuals experiencing multiple emotions at, at, at once but to what to what degree do you work with somebody um you know uh, uh, is there a, is there a particular point you would say oh, it's too soon or do you have different processes according to the amount of time that has passed since the loss does it is it is it a month or is it 50 years or and if is it everything it can be any of those things and i, I think I think early on, uh, when people are just reacting, that, that first level of the immediacy, when the, the, the coping and the conscious coping are not into play, 
I think all we can do is empathize and be with people. Um, I think it's at the point where people are beginning to process what's happened and begin to look at that coping uh, dimension that certainly from, from a, a care uh, point of view, whether it's professional or a volunteer group or whatever, that's the point at which it might happen. But I think it can be delayed for a, a huge amount of time. I mean, I've seen uh, women who were, were widowed with young families not actually beginning to address that grief until the youngest child has left home. And it's at that point that the space to do that. So yeah. I, I think it may be grossly misunderstood by everybody around, and not seen as appropriate even. But this is this is the way I think it works. That a, a time frame isn't helpful. Now, again, I, I think there's a lot of uh, research work that will produce will, will suggest that um, intense grief after a certain period of time is indicative of a complexity that needs a lot of intervention. And of course, I, I'm not in, in any way underestimating the proportion of people who may have a very severe grief reaction. Um, I mean, it, it, the view is about 10 to 15% may have that sort of reaction. But I think for, for other people, uh, reassuring people of the normality of what's going on and how it's woven within the rest of their the fabric of their life and what they're having to do. Again, you see, for many people, it may have economic consequences of bereavement. You know, a widow may suddenly have to sell a house or get a job. And are having to focus on those sort of practical uh, coping uh, issues will make the, the emotional and the psychological elements of grief not a priority. Um, mm. and, I wanted to ask, because one of the common threads in, in what we both do, I think, is is conversation. You know, obviously you and I are having a conversation now about grief and and we've been invited to do so. And I'm very grateful for that, um, because for me, it's the greatest thing that I can do to understand myself. So, I mean, you know, I'm in in a way that I only came to realise after quite a lot of time, Loved and Lost as a project was uh instigated by photographs um and that's the way in for the for the viewer and for the participant but actually what it was was a reason for me to talk about my own grief with people who had also um lost somebody and you know i obviously i formalized that and i was you know i'm sharing the stories through the website and through the book and that sort of thing but um i don't think outside of a uh a sort of formalized counseling sense there, there still isn't, you know, a huge amount of opportunity to have a conversation about grief, even though I think it's probably well understood that that's the best thing that we can do is talk about it. And uh, I wondered what your take on that was in terms of, you know, you, you talked very rightly about not wanting to over-professionalise um, us talking about grief, but how, how do we get people talking and how do we uh, sort of almost almost normalize the the fact that unless we don't unless we talk about it it's going to be something that you know st stays within us and we and we struggle to process yeah I, I i mean i think i think there are a number of things there i, I, I think it is a cultural reality and um i think for example we know when we think about the huge amount of uh, death and, and grief around with the first world war so, so much of that was put on hold. The same with the Second World War. This was, this was something that many of the people who went through those traumatic experiences never spoke about. Um, and I think that has been a contributory factor into a culture where we see ourselves as being strong if we don't address those things. Now, I, I, I'm wondering, <laughs> and I don't know quite how it will work, but it seems to me that the COVID pandemic has brought the whole issue of mortality and grief and bereavement into the public sphere in a way that we've never had it before. And I, you know, it would be wonderful. And I hope projects like Feed Sleep will contribute to this. I'm sure they will. 
to making that ability to speak more freely and for people to be more comfortable listening. I think that's one of the problems. Yeah, people right. are uncomfortable. And if we feel someone can't readily listen to our story, we're, we're going to close down on it. So I think we have to be careful that we don't see that. I, I imagine what people want is to make it make people better. And, and and that can be, oh, what can I do? L lots of solutions being offered. When I think what we really need to do is to be really comfortable with someone else's discomfort and distress and to convey to them that that's okay. It feels awful. I can't solve it, but I can actually hear it. And in hearing it, I can understand it. So I thought I'd make a bid for people to be better listeners. Mm. Uh, and, and if there is some way of us using this pandemic with people's personal knowledge and observed um, experiences of other people could bring to the fore a greater capacity for everyone to feel listening to the stories of loss is is not morbid it's not um it, it's not something that's unhelpful or not about being depressed or whatever it's about being human and uh i i, I think we shouldn't be afraid of other people's grief uh but that's a big ask in in a culture that steps away from it <laughs> yeah I, I mean i couldn't agree more that actually that that aspect of of listening is 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 the crucial part isn't it but i mean we live in this connected age in which all of us can reach out to each other in an instant from our pockets but actually that space in order to actively listen to one another and as you say not feel like you have to come up with some sort of solution or answer but actually just just to ask a question and be prepared to listen to the answer, whatever the answer may be. I think that's quite rare. You know, the way that we live socially, our communities now are very different. We don't live, uh, many of us don't live around the corner from family. There isn't a sort of an immediate neighbourhood in which people would know what what is going on in your life in order to instigate a conversation and ask the question and, and check in with you in, in the same way that um, maybe we, we used to. Um, and maybe you don't want everyone in the neighbourhood knowing what your business is, but actually uh, there's something about that sense of community, um, you know, and, and it's not whether it's not that we can't foster that online. There are there obviously means and ways to do that and, and for people to feel connected and, and find um, people who think in, in the same way. But actually, I, I do feel it's it's something that's harder to, to cultivate uh, in, in the modern age. I mean, especially given that we've spent the last... 15 months or so you know trying to actively avoid <laughs> being in the same room as each other i think it's really important that we find you know take the opportunity to find these new ways to to engage with one another and, and listen and we're all very busy and we've all got lots of stuff on and there's lots of you know children to feed and football to watch and all, that's, all sorts of things that are, are going to get in the way of us um, engaging with one another but um i think the more that we can do to foster that sense of um, sitting and listening, uh, the better it's going to be. And I, I think you're right. I think people are finding the, the way to um, uh, the internet for uh, places to share common uh, experiences of grief, which ha has to be a good thing. Mm. Uh, it's probably still a, a slight substitute for the immediacy of someone who is there. And I guess perhaps one of the other things um, I would be thinking about is how can we, within the education system, at a very early age, uh, enable children to listen to each other? And I think they can only begin to do that if they feel listened to themselves. And I think we have a world that's so busy, 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 <laughs> and I don't let myself off the hook there either, that, that somehow, there's always a good reason not to stop and linger and have what may be an ordinary conversation, but one that has a lot of meaning for people who are yeah. currently facing something that's difficult. 
It's so true. And just it's, sometimes it's those incidental conversations and sit with somebody on the corner and, and as a stranger, they might tell you something that they haven't told somebody else and, and just letting those words spill out of their mouth might be extremely helpful f- for them just because you're there and willing to listen. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, I suppose I, I, I'm conscious of the time because this isn't something we need to delve into necessarily, but that, you know, we, we're in a far more secular society than we used to be that, you know, there used to be, um, lots of formal ways in which grief was dealt with through um, you know, the rituals and, and, and church and things that that meant that there were very um, public ways in which in which you know death was dealt with in, you know in the, in the crudest term but but that that also meant that there was um, a sort of process an immediate process to go through you know which I, I imagine you know contributed to the emotional context of 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 grief in a, in a broader sense, which again is, is isn't there in in society in the same way as it was. So even having gone through the world wars and 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 lived out a period of uh, making sure that emotions aren't um, spoken about because they're going to get in the way, we've we've also lost that sort of sense of formality, which which would for a long time has has really supported the sort of grieving process. I think. I I, I mean I agree entirely with that. I, I mean I think. The whole question of ritual can give some common cues to people about um, support, and, and it yeah. may, may be a bit false at one level. But of course, people can give testament to the fact that in the absence of those rituals or the rituals supported by other people during the pandemic, they have felt very um, without that kind of support. And I know there is a tendency, as we become more secular, for people to be designing their own funeral services or, or, or the families designing it. And that can be hugely meaningful to individuals, but it leaves an awful lot of people who haven't that um, ability or imagine they haven't got that ability to find their way through a rather perhaps less meaningful set of processes that doesn't provide them with the kind of um, support and uh, insights that, that at its best, uh, traditional ritual has done. And I think there's, there's a, I mean, we did it for my sister, but we had an amazing Thanksgiving service. You know, there was the funeral and then the Thanksgiving service, but um, I think we were careful to make sure that within the Thanksgiving service that it was in, it sounds very morbid, but to say, look, she's died, she's gone. And and, and to celebrate the things that, the, the influence she had and the memories and the stories, but also, you yeah. know, that's, it's a very important part um, to, not necessarily just to verbalize it, but to make sure that, um, you know, there is an element of the ritual, which which is a very public and outward acknowledgement that, that this person is no longer with us. And it's very hard to do that, but actually, you know, those those older rituals are very good. You know, whether it's curtains closing or you know, how, however it's it's um, manifested in certain cultures. But it's it's important to go through those things. I think in order to to sort of feel the reality of it in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that corporate element is itself mm. supportive for people that. Um, um, the connectedness to community yeah which again during covid is something that so many people have been have been um stripped of the opportunity to have those people in that community you know even very close family members not being able to travel or, or attend it's 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 very tough so it, you know i i i i appreciate you're hopeful in terms of thinking about how we socially sort of reframe our discussion of grief but i really hope we're not going to live through a period of time where there are hundreds of thousands of people who've lost somebody and and sort of there's a sort of overwhelming sense of grief which nobody knows what to what to do with that it's 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 um at the least it's going to be very interesting to see how you know uh, as a society as a i mean i suppose internationally we um approach what's happened in the last um you know the last 18 months or so because it's such a significant thing that has highlighted, as you said, you know, our, our own mortality. And I, and I know so many people who, aside from losing somebody, completely reframed their 
lives and, and took a chance to take a step back and and consider their priorities and slow down, you know, through um, through last year. So it, it's, it'd be really interesting to see where that takes us socially in terms of our understanding of grief and how we interact with one another, I suppose. And I suppose it is such a reminder too of um, the way in which we are all united in, in the hazards of, of this pandemic and, and, and its consequences. And that in itself is giving us a common human experience that um, is, is, is really quite amazing <laughs> as, as a side effect. It may be a bad or it may be a, a good thing, but it's, it's, it's certainly a reality that we cannot divorce ourselves from seeing some of the awful um, experiences across the globe. Um, at home and, and abroad. Yeah. I find it quite difficult last year just to to see statistics and know that that was that was how everybody was sort of gauging how bad things were. But you know that for, that for every single one of those statistics, there's a there's a family and there's there is a, there's a sort of very qualitative experience, exactly. an emotional experience behind every um, every digit that yeah, yeah. that you saw. I, I, you know, I'm sure counselling services and etc have been sort of overwhelmed um over the Most last uh, year or so but but i think the more that we can do to converse and open up that conversation about it the the, the greater it will be and i you know um sam's just popped up here but I, my, my main takeaway from this will be linda's point about about listening i, I can't i couldn't agree more that, that the, the need to listen um, not only in the context of grief, but uh, at all, you know, and uh, offer people a chance to be heard um, is, is just absolutely vital. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, listening, that's, I just wrote that down as a, as a thing to just to mention when I came back in. Um, but uh, firstly, thank you. Thank you for that. It went very, very quickly for me. Um, it went really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did go quickly. <laughs> yes. You, we, you, you covered many, many areas. Gosh. It just goes to show, actually, that uh, there, is so much, there is so much to share and to say and mm. to, you know, kind of delve into around grief and bereavement and, and death. And then once we also start to talk about the pandemic on, on top of uh n normal grief outside the pandemic and that that's a whole other whole other area mm. but yeah it, it was a beautifully gentle chat um just uh it felt yeah. very good to talk to you simon <laughs> considering we hadn't rehearsed we <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean but the amount of common threads that we we share between mm -hmm. within what we've done it is it's quite remarkable actually you know and i i, um, I don't quite know how i've managed i totally felt like i was i've always been blagging my way through making this project it just started out of personal experience and was a very mm. instinctive thing to do uh, and and the structure of it just sort of felt right at the time you know when i was first starting out as a photographer but uh, it seems to the more you know i think it's been going for eight or nine years now but the the more I talk about it and the more that um, uh, I engage with other people regarding regarding it, the, the, the sort of greater the depth, you know, is, is revealed just because it's, there are all these strands that so many other people are trying to investigate and, and search and, and that every time I have a conversation about it, I, I'm like, oh, that, I can add another level of depth to, you know, the simplicity of taking two pictures and having a conversation. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, sorry for my sirens there. I live on this busy town in Reading, um, busy road in Reading. Um, yeah, a, a great pairing of two expert ex, expert listeners. You know that is what you. I'm going to say. Are, it. I'm with expert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you don't like to use the word expert, but I mean, really, you are. Um, okay, I'm going to see if anyone um, in the audience. <laughs> Uh, up there has anything to say or any questions at all um so we can open up the um chat a bit further 
We, t- um, I mean, we did as... touch on a lot of stuff there, didn't we? So, there like, was a lot. <laughs> so feel free to pull a thread if we've if we've scratched the surface and you want to know. Pull a thread is a yeah. nice one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you if anyone wants to engage with a Q and A, um, just use the chat box um, or raise your hand, which someone's already doing. So that's great. Um, now I can either read your question out for you, or if you want to pop up and um, ask your question yourself, you can. So just let us know. Um, actually, we've already got one here. So Leslie Beale. Hi, yeah. I haven't, I didn't, I don't, haven't written a question, but first of all, I want to say I did lots of head nodding in that, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, it resonated, you know, really, really great with me. Um, but I was going to go back to a point you made about your photograph and, you know, like some people can pick a photograph really easily, other people can can't, and it's sort of, it made me think of um, a film called Afterlife, which I don't know when any, any of you have seen it. It's a Japanese film and it's about people that have died and are stuck in limbo and they have to pick one memory to take with them into eternity, um, whether you believe in an afterlife or not, you know. And, um, and some people can't think of one. And so they get stuck there until they can find their memory. And, and it made me think, you know, like, what would my photograph be? So I was like mentally going through all my albums thinking about. And so I think it's a really, that's a really lovely idea really about the photograph or the, the memory. Um, because, you know, you kind of think that they're static, but they're not because they change all the time as well. Exactly. So, yeah. I think we get, we, we get attached to certain photographs as well uh, for, for sort of it, no particular reason or because it's convenient. Um, but actually, there's, there's a huge amount to be said for going back through old photographs and sort of re-remembering them, as it were. I've, I was very fortunate to, to have a whole box of um, prints that my nan had taken um, of, of us as kids and at family occasions and things, which I'd never seen before and didn't and wouldn't have ever thought of. But, um, you know, there's a picture of me and my dad sort of sweeping up on the patio. I mean, I'm too small to be helping, but, it, you know, it's a really, um, it's, not some, it's not a time I would remember. I was too small, but actually the memory is, the memories evoked because of the photo feel very, very tangible to me. And it's, um, it, it's a case of, we project so much onto these um, onto these pictures that what you know whether it was a certain day that we was a special occasion that we remember or um, or or often you know lots of us will be the ones taking the pictures you know in my family dynamic there's no pictures of me because <laughs> I'm always the one with the camera uh, and that's often something that people struggle with is, you know there isn't any pictures of just say you know the the mum and dad of the family because one of them will always be the one with the camera but there's there's um you know there's a huge amount of sentimentality and um circumstance which we which we build into these pictures as well as a sort of emotional context and and i think as you said it's really important to acknowledge that that changes over yeah. time you know i've got a photograph over here of, of me and my sister um which i think it was taken on on a beach in cornwall on a crazy golf course and i just had a one of those disposable throwaway film cameras five or six years ago and we just took a stupid sort of you know, cozy shot together. And, you know, at the time I wouldn't have thought anything of it. And after she passed away, I thought, I wonder, wonder what was on that camera, you know, and, and, and sort of took, took time to look through. And, and it's just us being really silly and fun together. And that's how I remember her. So that's the one I've, I've put up on the, on the shelf. So it's, you know, I'm a photographer, so I'm going to say it, but I, I, I can't, um, you know, overemphasize the importance of, of photographs, you know, in a personal sense. I think that, they, they do so much, um, you know, for us, it's, it's incredible. And, and sometimes it's the mundane rather than the momentous that kind of resonate with you as well. I think yeah, for sure. You always think that you want that, you, you might not go back to that photograph of that momentous moment. It can be those kind of more intimate ones that kind of stick with you, I suppose. Yeah. I, I don't know if my mum's watching this. I don't think she is, but the, her, her favourite photograph of, of my dad is sort of him wearing his sort of old grey jumper and just sort of caught in a moment. And technically as a photograph, I, I don't I really hate it because it's got a big flash and there's a big shadow behind. And But it, that's the one that she uh, she has framed it up on the shelf because that's the that's the sort of moment which 
she can see his little grin and and it's really endearing so you know as you see yeah it's a really it's really important to try and remember those um sort of in between moments that aren't wedding days or you know whatever occasion or birthdays whatever occasions in, in which somebody takes out a camera but often it is those times when there are lots of photographs so make sure you keep taking pictures on those in between times as well it's, it's something about the connections that we make isn't it the, the connections that are demonstrated the human connections but the the connection of place and somehow on a, on a single image there are so many levels and so many layers of connectedness that that can be unpacked and will speak to us individually as you're saying Simon some have a meaning that for someone else they might not even someone in your own family but there's, there's just something that connects and I think the work that you're doing is really uh, making uh, the opportunity to use that connectedness in a very creative way with grief. I, I think it's, it's terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie, for that. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So I, I have a question from Catherine Saul. Hi, Catherine. Um, and Catherine says, thank you to Simon and Linda. Um, so much to think about, so good to listen to you, especially about listening. I wonder if they could talk a little bit about speaking. Um, uh, yeah, about how to start speaking and sharing about grief for others to listen it is going to also require speaking and other ways of sharing um, she says through art perhaps yeah speaking that's a good one thanks Catherine well I, I, I think undoubtedly people do speak through art and I, I think there's a lot of projects um, that are used to enabled people to have a voice other than their literal speaking voice to um, be able to show what's what's going on inside them. And I think children and young people particularly use a medium of that kind to, to speak. Um, I, I, I think I think it depends a little bit what is meant by the speaking. Are, are you thinking particularly the voice of the, the, the grieving person and giving them a voice, um, Catherine, is that what you had in mind? Uh, yeah. 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 Hello, hi, Catherine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. So I, I, I suppose in a way that's partly in, in a more formal sense. And I, I realize in general population and general circumstances, this, this isn't personal, but certainly in the, in this sort of um, <clears throat> helping context, this adult attitude to grief scale with the nine items that have statements that people can agree or disagree and elaborate on gives people a cue into being able to talk about the various elements of their grief. But if we're talking about in day-to-day -day life, I think sometimes we just have to say to people, take your time. I, I, I think finding the words can be really quite difficult and one of the things about listening is also being able to tolerate silence that there hasn't always got to be something busy going on and um you know i i on numerous occasions and answering the phone uh, when i was running a service for the brief and you'd have someone who's so distressed and just to say take your time and to give those few minutes for the overt distress perhaps to subside a little and then for the story to begin to come out. Um, I think the other thing and again this goes back a little bit to therapeutic work but you can just as easily depend on an ordinary conversation is that uh, within our understanding of narrative there are three elements that we might use uh, at, at when we're telling a story. There's the external narrative, which is what happened and when. There's the internal narrative, which is about how have those events impacted on me. And there's the reflexive one in which I'm making sense of what went on. And so I think we can help the speaking by encouraging people to tell their story, to tell me what happened. How is that for you? 
I think by asking those questions that facilitate the narrative, um, we can do that. And that isn't just something we can do in a therapeutic sense. I think it's something we can do as we're listening to people to have those prompts, you know, to tell me what's happened. Um, how, how are you reacting to that? Um, what's going on now as you're thinking about that, those, those events? I think we can facilitate uh, the telling of that story, uh, but just with very simple prompts, not with lots of uh, interjections and, and so on. I think I certainly went through a phase of wanting to be asked all those questions mm. in order to speak, in order to verbalise. Mm. And um, I think particularly, you know, as a young man in his 20s, there wasn't necessarily space with friends necessarily to sort of, even though they might have known what's, what's happened, but to sort of suddenly bring it up in conversation. Um, and so actually, I think in a way, some of the more formalised reasons for engaging with um, grief were very helpful for me. So whether that's uh, a, you know a birthday or the anniversary of the, a passing or a special occasion in which you uh, you'd wish that person would be there, um, uh, and it's not necessarily about just sort of shoehorning in to a conversation um, about you know your your you know dead relative or friend or, or but but actually using those. Uh, contexts and being aware of your own emotional state in that space that actually uh, in some way it's very helpful what I found to, to let something out in some form you know even if it's just a sentence or two you know for me to say you know oh, dad would have loved today it would have been yeah, he would have really enjoyed that you know it, it, even if it's something mundane but actually just to um, just to verbalize it and and that just lets the people around you know that you're wanting to talk about it because actually so many people are afraid of making you upset and afraid to ask a question and don't they're complete they might be completely oblivious that that's what's on your mind in that in that context but for you it's all that's on your mind it's all you can think about and it's all you want to talk about so actually um it's not just about being brave and mustering up the courage to to open your mouth but but sometimes it, it is just sort of giving yourself a reason to to speak uh, and and find and and you might surprise yourself with what comes out of your mouth. You know, it, it, I think what Linda says is true. It's actually, it's good to take your time and, and not be afraid of silence. But actually, sometimes I found it's a case of just taking the plunge and opening your mouth and saying what, what you feel like needs to be said. And sometimes being surprised at what comes out of your mouth and either feeling better for it or, uh, or being surprised and, and saying, okay, well, I said it, I said it out loud and that's okay. And maybe next time I'll have a slightly more coherent thought or memory that I want to share with people. But, but you know, if the, if the people around you, you know, love you and, and care for you, then they'll appreciate that, you know, it's not an easy thing to, to verbalize and, and say out loud. Um, you know, I think we're all in different contexts and we've all got different relationships and, and different uh, means and ways of, of sort of divulging our, our grief. But um, for me, finding reasons to speak out loud has always been the most helpful thing. And I guess one of the things there is, particularly if there is a silence, one of the difficulties about social distancing, there isn't that opportunity just to put a hand on someone's arm, mm. just to communicate something uh, in a wordless way of encouragement or, or, or support. So I, I think in better times when we can be closer to people, uh, those kind of gestures of uh, empathy become a reinforcement of being able to, giving people permission to tell us how it is for them. Um, can I just bring you back to something, Linda, you started, you said a little bit about children and um, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that um, I'm often thinking about is you know how, how we educate children around grief and death because I mean as, as in my experience we we I say we my culture we don't um there's a there's a huge amount of fear around what what words to use how do we speak how do we speak about the dead um 
uh, you know, how, how, how young is too young for a child to go to a funeral, even anything like that. It, it's, um, it's really charged, it seems. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I think it go, goes back a little bit further because we all have a taste of grief with loss and change in our life. Mm -hmm. And if we acknowledge the losses and changes that children go through and allow them to have some insight about them, and some sense of how they can manage them and cope with them, then I think when it comes to death and dying, mm -hmm. then I think that becomes a lot easier, that the communications have been much more open. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that it's not that easy to say there's a specific age when a child should or shouldn't go to. I think if they've got some cognitive capacity about what it is, then the discussion should be with them. Would they like to go to the And to tell them what it will be like. I mean, we do prepare children for some aspects of loss. I mean, there are books now that there weren't when I was young. You know, yeah, going yeah. to the dentist, a new baby. Lots of, lots of books for little children that prepare them for things that may be stressful. And I think if um, a child wants to go to a funeral, then to be able to tell them what's going to happen so that they can ask questions about it. And maybe, depending on who it is that's died, someone else take a little bit of responsibility for looking after that child mm -hmm. if their parent is, is really in a state not to be able to handle their own grief and their child as well. But mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's, it's important not to exclude children. And I think if we, if we look you know, back in history, the fact that mortality was, was much more an everyday part of domestic life, children were not uh, shielded from that and had an understanding and an engagement with it. So I, I, I think it can be a mix of those sort of formal ways of introducing into education, and that's home, you know, in the home as well as in school, that we talk about these things that, that are changing, that are difficult for people, um, and, and prepare them by allowing them to ask questions. Because sometimes they will ask very, very insightful questions. Um, <laughs> well, the shockingly insightful questions that um, uh, we, we don't necessarily uh, think they might um, ponder on. But I think set against that, is, is driving underground some of the fears or anxieties that might go around death that they don't think about um, uh, and, and, and can't articulate and carry that forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, see if anyone else has got any more thoughts. Nothing coming up. Maybe. Oh, there we go. Here's one. <laughs> okay. Um, so, actually, let's just hear um, hear again from Leslie, and then I think I might have another one coming in after that on the chat. So, yeah, Leslie. Sorry, it's Leslie. me again. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Okay. I was just going to go back as well to the point about about secular and, and how important rituals are. And yeah. I think that, you know, we, we negate those in the secular society to our detriment, I think. And I think secular shouldn't mean that it's not sacred or spiritual and profound in some way. And when my father died, he, he's an atheist, I'm an atheist. We prepared his funeral um, ourselves and did it all ourselves. Um, but I kind of, I, I, the, I knew that the funeral was really important because it gave you a, some kind of closure. But my mother died um, in April last year in, in the middle of COVID. And we didn't have any funeral for her because we, you know, it, it was at the point when they would only allow six people to, to gather together. And I suddenly realized how important that ritual of, of a funeral was actually by not having one for my mother. So I kind of think that in a secular society, we need to embrace ritual more. Mm -hmm. 
yeah absolutely I, I, and i do hope you'll be able to to have a some sort of ceremony in due course for, for your mum but I, yeah I, I absolutely agree i you know i think whatever you believe um in terms of afterlife or of of a creator or whatever you you know whatever that looks like for you there's there's so much to be um gained from a sort of not necessarily an expected um set of rituals but but going through something that has the, the and it's, I, mean, I suppose it's to do with putting significance and putting meaning on certain things so whether that's you know planting a tree or being in a certain place that you can return to or or going through you know going through certain you know just very deliberate actions or agreed actions um in a communal sense you know with with others not not just on your own um you know it, it's it's such an important practice to go through and i'm certainly not somebody who's well read well read about about this sort of thing but you know it just instinctively um knowing that you i mean we, we scattered my sister's ashes on a, on a beach in cornwall which was extremely poignant and there, there wasn't a huge amount of us there but actually knowing that there's a place that i can go back to and and both recall you know that occasion but also have a very happy time on the beach with family and um but to have gone through it together and the physicality of you know digging in the sand or or you know the various things that we we sort of did on that on that morning um it was was all part of that sort of letting go process and it wasn't something that was written in a book anywhere and or had been done for hundreds of years it was something that we talked about together and decided this is how we're going to do it and who's going to stand where and who's going to do what and and that was all part of it and you know who's going to say something and if you don't want to say something that's fine but it, it was really um poignant for that for that reason so i think we can make up our own rituals in some way but it's about being deliberate um together i think i think that's that's my perspective on it yeah and and i think you know, there are two, two elements of this. There's, there's what we're saying about the person who died in relation to us and what we're saying about ourselves in yeah. relation to this person and our wider understanding of life and death. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think being able to capture all of those things which are deeply and intrinsically meaningful to each of us may be captured in very different ways and, and if we haven't got a, a a set ritual to follow then i think having the opportunity to create something meaningful is is very important my worry slightly is those people who fall between having one of those more scripted rituals that would have given some meaning and not quite finding the way to give full expression to to the, the meaningfulness of the person and the meaningfulness of me within that situation. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, th I think it's very difficult to work out a ritual that serves your needs and also the needs of the person that's died um, and unscripted. And un I, I, yeah, I think I think it, it's really hard. And I think that's where secularism falls down in a way. I mean, there's a huge amount to be said for, you know, having a piece of text which is designed specifically for the purpose of the occasion of a funeral or saying goodbye to somebody which um you know instigates thought and and has a sort of sense of gravity which somebody hasn't had to sort of suddenly muster in the in the two weeks since somebody passed away and and the poignancy of you know of music and and all being in a space and listening to a particular piece of music whether that's something that was you know, specifically written to be played at funerals or somebody's favourite song. You know, there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, collectively engaging in, you know, a poem or a piece of music that that will that will, you know, bring, you know, evoke all, all sorts of different things for different people. Um, uh, but those those things that I think I think as Linda's saying, there's there's plenty of people who who might not have the capacity or the energy necessarily within very short period to sort of muster up something that's extremely personalized so there's certainly still place for those sort of well-grounded you know texts and music and and ritualistic things that that mean that it, there's a sort of 
uh, a unified sense of this is what we're doing and why we're doing it and in order for it to feel real I suppose because it, otherwise it can feel very surreal it can sort of drift by and I think it's those rituals that add that sense of um, reality and gravity which is uh, are so important. I think one of the things I'm always amazed by is the capacity people have to create poetry when they're grieving. Yeah. People who would never never imagine writing and often it can be those very personal things that people have written that can be incorporated into, into a funeral and that sort of ritual, but can be part of the ongoing mini rituals, if you like, of people um, acknowledging what this relationship was about. But I, I think there's just such amazing ways in which people use the very specific medium of poetry at the time of the grief. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm where we're due to finish. Um, sadly, actually, <laughs> could go on a very long time. Maybe just to kind of draw those uh, two points together there. I love the idea of mini rituals as well. It's, it's a good thing to, to keep mindful of, having mini rituals as well as the larger ones. Yeah. But um, just from HG, um, has said my four-year-old twins, so we're going back to children like I was asking about, yeah. my four-year-old twins saw their father's body and attended the funeral and said a poem so back to poetry they had great support doing this and now have memories and solace in saying goodbye yeah, yeah and that's I, it's really important that we my brother-in-law did something similar with my sister's child and mm. and it was a, it was very important um because she won't have many memories but to yes. to have given them the option of of attending certain things or not but then to say uh, you know, later in life, but we gave you the choice, and you said yes. But it was important that you were there, you know, like you were, you know, you were there for that um, that occasion, and and it was, it was, it was, you know, it was interesting at the time because she wasn't very aware of what was going on, and and she was sort of flitting between lots of family members, but all of whom were so grateful to be in her presence and have her in the space as well as um, know that you know she wanted to be there. So it's. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy. And I mean, I'm not necessarily going to get into uh, this a lot, but I mean, kids are surrounded by the notion of death through all sorts of stuff that they engage with stories. And, you know, every a character dies in every Disney film, don't they? And it's not, it doesn't have that sense of depth and understanding, which we're necessarily alluding to. But I think we'll be surprised mm -hmm. at the amount of understanding that, that you know, even very young children would have. And, and even in, in a broader sense, you know, are able to have a conversation and, and sort of grapple with things. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think so, it's a really, it's really lovely to hear that um, those, those kids were able to be part of that and, and contribute in such an important way. And I, I'm sure that hasn't gone, uh, I'm sure it didn't go unnoticed for, for everybody else who attended how, how poignant and important that, that was. I mean, more so than many other people taking part on that occasion, I suppose. And I, I think another point about this is children can feel excluded from something that may be raising all sorts of anxieties because they are excluded from it. And, and the openness and the opportunity, and I've certainly worked with families where children have been excluded and have become very resentful afterwards and yeah. feel that they've missed out. Now, again, I wouldn't say children should be made to go, <laughs> no, apart no. from it, but, but I think that, that that open conversation allows the child not to have another layer of fear by being excluded from what's going on as a very powerful event within the family. Yeah. Okay, I must stop us. <laughs> I'm really sorry to draw this to an end. Um, I truly am. Um, it's been really wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon and Linda, for your generosity and um, bringing your two really different perspectives here, but they've met in the middle and kind of made a, a brilliant a combination um, together. So yeah, really wonderful. And thank you for um, everyone who's still here <laughs> to, um, for your contributions in, in the conversation as well. It, it really did feel like a shared conversation, even though we are just looking at um, little gray boxes with names in. Um, so 
genuinely thank you for for attending and and being with us um and we shall say goodbye now to everyone who has attended thank you so much for coming and go well thanks so much everybody thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thanks, Bye. Catherine. thank you thanks very much it's excellent thank you Sorry, I was just getting rid of the last people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's always that's always difficult. That last moment.